Veterinary Medical Board. Anne Marie will ro call roll and establish a quorum. Dr. Dr. Waterhouse? Present. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Dr. Waterhouse? Present. Dr. Sullivan? Here. Dr. Nunez? Here. Dr. Noland. Here. Jennifer Laredo? Here. Kathy Bowler? Here. Lee Heller? Here. And Judy Mancuso? Here. Um, in our large audience that we have today, <laughs> oh, would geez. anyone like to introduce themselves? Thank you. Um, to agenda item number 14, uh, review of legal guidance on DVM graduates practicing as RVTs, discussion of possible board action on proposed statutory amendments to require registration. I think Anne Marie is going to give us some background material on this. Yeah, so under item 14, you have an actual um, legal memo from Tara Welch that really outlines the question that we came to at our last board meeting, which is, can we make this provision retroactive? Could we tell those DVM graduates that have been practicing as RBTs that they're no longer eligible to do so and that effective today they must stop and get an RBT license? So this really talks about the prospective approach to implementing a new statute that would require DVM graduates to sit for the RBT exam and make application as an RBT. Um, so you probably had a chance to read the, me the memo. One of the more important aspects of this memo is the statutory change that council feels is required, and we had talked about this before. The provisions that were in the regulations originally that allowed for some sort of exception for DVM graduates there was no exception for this in the statute. There was no exemption, and we just somehow created a regulatory provision that said, you can continue working, but you can't do anything above and beyond that of an RVT. So if we truly want to close the gap, we would need to propose a statutory change that has a prospective date, and it gives due notice to those DVM graduates that have been practicing as an RVT that as of, and we use the date January 1st, 2019, a graduate of a recognized veterinary college must do these things in order to be registered as an RVT. And that after this date, they will no longer be able to continue functioning in that capacity without the benefit of a registration. Anne Marie just hit the nail on the head with that introduction. Um, I really don't have that much to add. So, uh, yeah, no, it was great. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's really about whether or not the board wants to move forward with the proposed regulatory action to um, institute a new regulation to close the gap for DVM graduates working as RVTs without registration um, to make sure that these particular individuals have enough notice that they uh, would no longer be able to perform in that capacity, we would need to make it a prospective law rather than um, retrospective. So the, the real concern is whether or not the board has authority to create an exemption. Although it currently exists, um, if you're changing a regulation at this point, um, the council is such that uh, you would not want to attempt to create an exemption for RVTs who are DVM graduates. Um, the appropriate approach would be to change the statute first uh, and then address the statutory language, uh, which would effectively be operative um, at a future date so that these particular individuals have enough time to figure out what they're going to do, um, whether it's to uh, qualify for registration um, or do something else. Question. Judy. How many uh, people do you think fall into this category? 
When we talked about this at the board meeting, there was some, and I don't know how accurate this is, but guess that it's probably between 25 and 30 persons. So it's not a large population. Uh, have they been noticed at all yet or no, no not until because we're all still this working happens. through it. Yeah. Got it. And this is where I got tripped up when Kurt was trying to explain this the last time. It's really about due notice to those that are currently in this category. Mm -hmm. You can't just, you know, without it being um, subject to challenge, and I think it otherwise would be, tell them that they have to stop doing what they've been authorized to do all these years without giving them due notice. So this would, in effect, be applied retroactive. That was just a different. No. So those people that those people that are practicing, DVM graduates that are practicing as an RVT, um, that have been doing that so far, could continue doing that up until up until January first, twenty nineteen. But after that, then yes, yes, okay, totally fair. Yes, Dr. Sullivan. I thought the discussion I think was at the MDC meeting was that a new graduate could continue to do this for like eight months or so. Is it? Well, that's actually part of the regulatory proposal that would implement this. So I think it says... It's actually um, within eight months of graduation, yeah. Yeah. they could work as an RVT. And that was in the language that the MDC concluded and so if you turn the page to the DVM graduate RVT language and look at third page of the next memo or is it second page sorry second page of the next memo it says that any person who receives a doctorate of veterinary medicine degree from a recognized veterinary college listed in section 2022a or a person who is in with within eight months of his or her anticipated graduation date shall be eligible for a period of one year to apply for the National Veterinary Technician Examination. Where are you? This is, well, this was sent out by email after your packets um, came to you. So we probably have extra sorry, copies of this somewhere. So, no, that's fine, just so it's there. Okay. So I see it here and I, yeah, so I have it. Do you want to read it? No, no, that's fine, as long as it's there. I yeah. just didn't see it in this. In this yeah. Type. It's the oh. summary from the 20, January 2017, 2017 MDC meeting. 2017. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. it. Yeah. So the statutory change would create kind of the authority, and then we'd come back with regulation right. to do the implementation. Okay. And so do we need a vote today? If the board would like me to pursue legislation to effectuate this, we do. I don't know if it's, if there's time for us to plug it in somewhere this year. We can make that attempt, but we're kind of, you know, getting into the heat of the uh, legislative cycle, so I can make a request, but it may be next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also yeah, just want to make a note. It would be a heavy lift. <laughs> yeah. um, just a note that uh, if legislation is pursued next year, then the date would need to change. Yeah, it would just move forward, yeah. yeah. It, it, it seems like, although this is a good idea moving forward, the urgency, if there are only 25 or 30 people doing it, is not such that we should feel like we have to shovel this into this year's legislative calendar. We really, the point is we really don't have no idea because these people aren't registered. True. So yeah. We have no idea how many people True. are out there. there could I know be more. I'll, I'll, I'll second know. Dick's motion. Well, he didn't, he I didn't hear the motion. He said he moved. He, it, no. Okay. I move that we send this forward uh, for the legislative uh, statutory changes. Second. Any discussion? Any comments from the public? Can you come up forward yeah. and identify yourself, please? Sure. Hello, Diane Sokoloff from the Attorney General's Office. The only question that I have is, presumably this is, this is a proposed statute, is that right? And then the statute refers to a current statute, 2036. That's a reg. Oh, that's a reg. Is that reg going to be go away when yeah. it's not going to undo this statute is not going to undo this reg so you're going to have you're going to have two regs because you're going to make another reg you're going to create so, another reg so diane that reg it 
that reg defines what an RVT can do. So this is basically, that statute will say they, they can work as a RVT pursuant to what the definition of RVT duties are. Okay, so yeah. that's always gonna stay constant. Yeah. All oh, right, I was just anticipating maybe some problems moving forward, but it's yeah, probably no. not gonna happen, okay. <coughs> Yes, Kathy. Do we need to, mm -hmm. to take uh, Tara's suggestion, do we need to amend anything in here about, depending on the legislation, the date, we're not adhering to the date of 2019? Or do, what do we want to stipulate that? To, so we, our intent is... Right, our intent it. is just to move it forward, depending on when we can do it, the, the date may be that. flexible. Yeah, okay. yeah. Any other discussion? for the vote. Dr. Waterhouse. Yes. Dr. Sullivan. Yes. Dr. Nunez. Yes. Dr. Nolan. Yes. Jennifer Laredo. Yes. Kathy Bowler. Yes. Lee Heller. Yes. And Judy Mancuso. Yes. Okay. You and Daniel. Quite a stark contrast from this one. Moving on to agenda item number 15, discuss implementation issues regarding the Veterinary Assistant Controlled Substances Permit Program. And I think, Amory, are you going to give some background and then you go to Ethan? Yeah. <laughs> Look at Ethan, what? I'm giving, I'm giving you a heads up there, Ethan. <laughs> Ethan, just in case, it's, we're talking about BACSP stuff, so if you want to move to the table in case they have questions. Um, so if you recall, at the last meeting, we had several kind of outstanding questions about implementation of the VACSP program. And in particular, people were really confused about euthanasia technicians, animal control officers, and shelter staff that would or would not be required to hold a VACSP. So once again, Tara did um, all of the heavy lifting on this and went back, looked at the um, prevailing statutes that would really impact who gets a permit and who doesn't. And there are some exceptions. And really, when you look at the language of the euthanasia technician, it was explicitly created before the VACSP um, permit. In doing so, there was no attempt when we created the permit to undo that exemption for the euthanasia technician. So it seemed to be deliberate that they remained in their own category legislatively. So according to looking at kind of the whole statutory scheme, the Controlled Substances Permit Act, our own uh, Veterinary Practices Act, and some penal code sections that apply to animal control officers, it appears that euthanasia technicians, animal control officers, humane officers, which of course are covered under a completely different statutory scheme, are exempt from a VACSP permit. Those for the purposes of administering controlled substances, let's be clear, if they do anything else veterinary medicine related, they would need to be under the direct supervision or perhaps indirect supervision, depending on what they're doing, of a veterinarian. This isn't a blanket exception, ex exception that they can practice veterinary medicine. They just don't need the VACSP permit to work in their very limited scope. That means for euthanasia technicians carrying the sodium pentobarbital, that would be acceptable because under their exception, they're able to do that. Animal control officers are able to sedate in the field as are humane officers and they're covered under a specific practice act for their scope of responsibility. Um, boarding facility staff, I think we were all pretty clear on if, you're, if it's just a carryover from the client saying, hey, my dog or cat is on this med, can you please continue you know, giving my dog or cat these meds in my absence under a boarding situation? That is not practicing veterinary medicine. If it's your receptionist who is handing medicine to a client, um, perhaps they may be, you know, someone comes in for a prescription refill, they're taking it out of their alphabetized drugs behind them to give to the client, that would not require a VACSP permit. We go back to the intent of this statute, which was to prevent diversion. So this is specific, should be specifically applied to those people that have access to and administer controlled substances. So they could independently go into the locked drug box, get controlled substances, and perform whatever services are within their um, 
official duties in a veterinary practice, those individuals need to be permitted. Terry, did you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, I just want to clarify that ACOs, there's no exemption for them under the VACSP. They just have their own statute authorizing them to do that mm -hmm. under the penal code. Right. And are they fingerprinted? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. But and that's in accordance with, I believe, um, their employment. Mm -hmm. Question, it's actually for Jennifer. The euthanasia text, I mean, I've heard in the shelters ketamine and even the blue stuff can be cut into drugs and they as street drugs and they sell it and actually this was quite a big problem in Southern California and I won't name any shelters or anything um, so I'm wondering about the euthanasia tech I mean to me it's it seems that they should be fingerprinted and they should be a part of this they're not exempt under the ACO they don't have the same standards, and I and I know the drugs walk out of there. So, um, I, had, I had actually wait, 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 before this was in stone voted against oh. having that's, the euthanasia that's, that's technicians that's get the nice. permit because that's all they're handling. It can be abused, as Dr. Waterhouse pointed out. I'm I'm actually going to ask Alin because she's in a different shelter, but in our shelter. Our employees, all of them, temporary, everybody go through a background check, mm -hmm. and we hand them one bottle at a time. So they have to come to us every single time they need more. We're keeping track of where the drugs are going. So I can tell you nothing's walking out of our shelter that we don't know about, but I don't know what, what other shelters do. Did you say you, what'd you vote against, you said? Uh, against have the uh, euthanasia technicians having to get this permit. Okay, so you, you didn't see a need for it. No. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. And ditto at our shelter, um, the, euth the euthanasia certified people there do not have unlimited access right. to the drug. They have limited access and have to sign out the specific amount and fill out extensive paperwork. Okay, thank you. Um, I can tell you at my, sh sorry, I can tell you at my shelter, um, while the people are background checked, they're currently allowing um, people with background checks who have multiple DUIs, um, one person who has stalking behavior recorded, um, access to the euthanasia solution. Um, so I think it, not forcing these people to be re held accountable um, is dangerous to the public. Um, we've not had issues with drug walking out of the, the clinic, um, although like the youth of thrill, like you were speaking mm -hmm. of, Ms. Mancuso, mm -hmm. um, is talked about. People take euthanasia solution mm -hmm. because it's like a high, it's crazy. It's crazy. Uh, fortunately, it's not a problem at our shelter, but there are these risks, these people with these, these deviant behaviors that are being allowed access to something that could potentially be used for date rape or other harm. Could you tell me what youth of thrill is? The people call it youth of thrill when they take euthanasia solution as like, like a... Um, high. Thank you. Recreationally. Yes. Just, I, 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 I'm telling you, this is an issue. It, it, yeah, it can be. <laughs> you should talk to Erica Hughes. What's the cost of release? That's that's my concern as well because I know people who abuse these drugs. They get very good at being um, diverting it. They get very good at you know um, diluting diluting out the euthanasia solution with water so it looks like yes. you have the right volume. Yes. They get very good at it, and uh, the original yeah. purpose of this bill, the original yeah. purpose uh -huh. of the of the permit process, was to prevent diversion. And I'm worried at shelters, which are even probably more lax than the average veterinary hospital, that diversion could happen easily. Well, true. I know we're very strict at our shelter. Yes. There's only a limited amount that the um, officers have access to, and they're all euthanasia certified who do that. Um, but I, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that by not requiring this, we would be um, making it easier for those who would divert. I agree. Dr. Nunez. I think the real problem with this is that this uh, directive came from above yes. uh, to, to try to avoid diversion. And it is really difficult to apply it in our profession because in human medicine, if a controlled substance is being prescribed to a patient and the person who's delivering it has access to it only gives them 15 pills when the bottle says 30 pills, 
<laughs> the patient's going to say, what is the rest of my 15 pills? But in our field, it, our patients don't know that they didn't get a full prescription. And so there's your, your description that, or your definition that a, a person that's working in a kettle is not practicing veterinary medicine, so therefore they have access to give controlled substance to a patient as, as requested by the owner versus um, a, a permit holder in a veterinary hospital who has access to the drug that's filling prescriptions. They're not practicing veterinary medicine either, but they, there's a potential for diversion there. There's a potential for diversion in all those places because and we, I know that I said that. It, it's hard to fit this into our profession is what, is what I'm saying because the, pers the person who's working in the kennel and giving controlled substances to a border, mm. I think just has as much a risk of diversion to the person who is working in a small clinic that's filling prescriptions um, for, um, for patients. I, I don't think there's any less risk of diversion in those two instances. I'm not going to vote against it because it, it, it has to somehow work in our profession, but I do have to acknowledge there's risk for diversions in all those circumstances. So, and I just wanted to follow up with it because I come from the shelter perspective. And when this went into effect, I got a call from uh, one of the groups I work with looking for clarification, and I called Anne Marie. Um, so, it's a private nonprofit that takes care of animals at a municipal shelter. And on the weekends, they have selected volunteers who, in acting under veterinary supervision, provide the weekend meds. And in a couple of cases, if they have animals that are on, say, buprenorphine for pain control, the vet staff pulls up the medication beforehand, labels it carefully, and has it ready. But the volunteers are implementing it on the weekend, and they wanted to know, did this require that these volunteers get a VACSP? I think at the time, Anne-Marie, you said no. But it sounds like we're heading in the direction of saying yes. So that then imposes a financial burden on this small nonprofit, and as they're very selective about their volunteers, but even so, as volunteers change and they train the new ones coming in, they're going to constantly have to purchase more VACSPs. So then is there a mechanism for discounts for Correct. nonprofits? So, you know, we want to respect the public safety issue, but also acknowledge, again, that this model doesn't necessarily fit the different ways that medicine is practiced on animals. Well, and yeah, an, an example would be if there's, a, if there's a pet boarding for a week and receives phenobarbital twice a day, and if the, the kennel assistant is giving him one phenobarbital and the right. second dose is given to himself, the pet's probably not going to have a seizure during that boarding time, and half of the medicine is gone. There's the potential there. Okay, I need to remind yes. everybody that we regulate the practice of veterinary medicine, and we're talking about people that are not within the realm of veterinary medicine. Border staff are not we don't regulate those individuals. Which is why I said I'm going to vote. We don't regulate the foster family that's taking home the animal. No, but I'm talking about the veterinary assistant in the shelter environment. And that person should be registered, okay. but not the foster family. That's I wasn't taking talking about home. the foster family. Yeah. The assistant. yeah, but well, the, when I called about this, I was told, no, actually, that's OK. OK, so because what you're describing, Lee, hold on. Okay. What you're describing is an individual that's taking pets home all over the weekend. No. Mm -mm. That's no. how you describe Medicating it. Medicating at the shelter. Oh, yeah. at the shelter. At the, yeah, because not the, vets, the vet staff are not there on the weekend, so they set up all the medication, and the, sh the volunteers come in on the weekend. And Then I think, yes, absolutely. But if you're talking about people that are taking them home to administer meds until they can adopt them out, no. that's the same as a client. Yeah, no, that was not the scenario. Okay. So there's nothing to vote on here. This Good. is already the Go way ahead. it is. And... <laughs> This isn't about whether or not we feel that Tara's legal analysis helps or hurts. It is what it is. We're providing further clarification on the laws as they exist. Now, if the board wanted to take an active motion to somehow change the euthanasia technician statutes, I guess that's within your pur purview, although that's not agendized today. So this was basically a background document to provide you an explanation of where the laws are today. Dr. Sullivan. Isn't this information on our website? Yep. Okay. Well, the FAQs are, yeah. Dr. Nolan. I think it is important. I, don't know. I, I did do a ride-along, a hospital inspection ride-along, and I think it is really important that the inspectors are clear about this because on my ride-along, 
in my my impression of what the inspector said was different than what Anne Marie just said. So I think it is very important, though, that we do clarify the nuances. So we have been working with our inspectors, and one of the problems that we encounter is when we go into a facility on inspection, what we tell the managing licensee and the office manager is you need to get your employees permitted if they have access to your controlled substances. That's it, because we can't tell them who does what, when, where. That's their job to know who's accessing those controlled substances. Well, this inspector basically indicated that the receptionist handing out the drugs also needed to be. So I'm just telling you what I heard with yeah. my ears. So yeah. I think we need to be very clear to everyone involved on our side that this is how we are interpreting the rules. And, and I, I'm just telling you. I believe you. <laughs> but I'm also saying that they have been trained. So if we have an individual that needs some additional education, we will make sure that happens. Not only that, it's on our FAQs on the board's website. So, but, but you see the, you yeah. see the yeah. miscommunication yeah. there. It's on the website, but they hear something different that's very right. yeah. hard to deal with. So yeah. we just need to maybe put it in writing, for, maybe for our hospital inspectors at okay. some point so that they understand. Sure. Jennifer. I have a question for Ethan or Anne Marie. I wasn't able to find the answer to this, not that I looked very hard. Um, <laughs> The VACSP was implemented in October. What's the due date, like the date that everybody, all the assistants have to have this permit? So Jennifer, the reason you don't find that is because that would not be appropriate for us to, to print. Like if you don't get it by December 31st, we're slapping you with a fine. Our message to everybody is it's in effect now, you need to make it happen. Okay. So it's up to the board once they've been educated to say, You've been advised, you had an inspection, the information's been out there, the associations have done a really good job at disseminating that information. There's no excuse for you not to do this at this point. So effective immediately, yeah. <clears throat> Any questions from the public? I've heard anecdotal reports that there's a a backlog in getting the permits once the application is, is that true or is that just a rumor? We had a backlog in linking the supervisor to the veterinary assistant, but actually getting them permitted, we've done a great job at getting everyone permitted. There was a backlog in how you link the supervisor to the veterinary assistant. And so we've had to work some overtime, some weekends. Ethan's staff has done a great job at trying to clear that backlog. So the backlog wasn't the initial permit. It was the linkage on breeze between the supervisor and the veterinary assistant. So if, if someone applies for a VACSP, they should be able to get one relatively quickly. Ethan can talk more about the processing timeline. As with most of our applications, we tell people it's going to be an eight-week process, and that's what we've been operating under. And how many applications have we had? Over 3,000. And how many have permits have been issued? It's in there. He's going to cover yeah, this. It's, okay. It's, yeah. Yeah, comes Ethan, why don't you cover it in your 3, licensing 000. report? Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So the backlog is fake news. <laughs> <laughs> Alternate fact. Not really. <laughs> Any other comments? I have a question. Yes, Judy. What was, uh, there was that original estimate of how many people would need a VACSP license. What was that? Do you remember? You're talking about when we did, when we estimated yeah. the amount of folks we yeah. uh, just uh, educated guess was about 13,000 and, and, over the and, course of several years as the program ramps up. Right, and so we have 3,000 waiting and how many have signed up? Well, 3,000 applications, more than oh, 3,000 applications total. received to date since October 1st, Okay, 2016. so maybe there's another 10,000 that are still coming. Well, I know Banfield is going to send us close to 1,000. Yeah. I've been in discussion with them to get them online, so. Because that yeah. was our money for the yeah. hospital inspections. And well, that's why we don't ever. have the money, because we haven't had the, right. We'll talk about it Later. in the budgets. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Okay, moving on. Um, board chair report. This is just a list of what I've been doing since Not our last meeting. 
On February 2nd um, of this year, I attended the Animal Physical uh, Rehabilitation Task Force meeting in Sacramento. Um, and, and then on March 13th, I participated in the webinar uh, that was put on by AABSB on yeah, telemedicine. Animal is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> it's not the annual. No. It's coming back. <laughs> I did not say annual. I Although you I should. I thought I heard you say Animal <laughs> physical. Oh, that's animal. Animal. Okay. <laughs> I should have said APR. Yeah. So on March 13th, I participated in the AAVSB webinar on telemedicine, and Dr. Sullivan is on the AVMA committee for telemedicine, so we look forward to his input on this topic, um, as will be discussed at a future board date. Uh, on April 2nd, I completed my ethics training for public officials, and so this is a reminder to everybody that in all the odd years, we need to do our ethics training and our sexual harassment prevention training. Um, so don't forget to do that. At all, everybody every does on every odd year? Is every that how it works? Every odd year. Well, okay. the one was every five years. Driver's training is every four years. Four years. Yes. Okay, so we all need to do it this year. Yes. Uh, on Monday, I, I attended the expert witness training held in Sacramento that was put on by Candace and, and Betsy, and that was very interesting. That's the first um, uh, expert witness training that I'd been to. It was... Um, it was informative, and the best part was in the afternoon when we all kind of, and Kathy was there, uh, we all kind of huddled up and talked about, uh, we heard kind of the issues, and they were trying to iron out some things, and, and um, one of the things that we mentioned, they mentioned, was that the expert witnesses, when they're writing their um, report for the administrative law judge, said, well, put it in, you know, just put it in broad terms and because you're not writing for a veterinarian, you're writing for this judge who doesn't know medicine. And I'm like, but after it goes to the judge, it comes to us. Oh, interesting. And I said, you got to put enough information in there that I can, we can judge, that we can tell what's going on. And they go, oh, we never thought about that. So anyway, things like that help. Um, and then this weekend, I will be attending the CVMA Board of Governors meeting in Anaheim uh, to give the VMB board report. So. That's a list of my activities, because I haven't been doing enough. Yes. Great. Um, and then, Jennifer, you have the RVT report? I do. So I have a, one, thing that's, one thing that's been on all of my reports that it looks like it's been addressed. Um, Breeze is actually going to retroactively fingerprint everybody who wasn't. I saw that, so that's great. I can mark that off of my report every single time. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, <laughs> NAVTA has approved a specialty, so the Academy of Physical Rehabilitation Veterinary Technicians, so that was great for NAVTA. Um, the AABSB has a job analysis for the VTNE underway, and I will be participating in that, so. Oh, that's good. Yay me. <laughs> and as we saw on the website, the job analysis of the state, California state RVT exam was done, so I'm, I'm pretty anxious to uh, address that when it's ready to be discussed at the board. I have heard some concerns um, from the RBT school community about the pass rates, but I do see in Ethan's report that he has yet to give that the pass rates are going up, so I'm very pleased to see that. Um, the, the one thing I have on here um, as a potential future agenda item is the issue of RVT graduates of foreign institutions. There's currently an eligibility pathway for foreign grad DVMs, but not one for RVTs. So I know that the board had written a letter to the AABSB requesting a working group. Do we have an update from them? What they've told me is they're aware of it and they'd like to address it. And we offered to work with them at which point they want to discuss that. Balls I don't have a date. Yeah. And that is all I have today. Thank you. And you know, we all really should thank Jennifer because not only is she on the veterinary medical board, she's on the multidisciplinary board, and she gives the RBT report. So you have like triple duty there. We thank all you, thank Jennifer. you. It's really hard. Thank you. <laughs> we should thank her. <laughs> we should. Yeah. No one's really done it yet. <laughs> Now we have the executive officer and staff reports. 
that's, you, know. you guys turn it over to e, uh, over to A, and then I'll turn it over to Ethan. <laughs> Ethan's going to give his administrative and budget report. Including in that report is an update on our fee audit. And that really speaks to something Judy brought up yesterday. We had done an internal fee audit on exam costs, but now we've hired a third party outside contractor to come in and audit all of our fees. Great. And they're already starting their project and they've interviewed Candace and Ethan, and I'm not going to steal Ethan's thunder. So <laughs> yeah. that's okay, you got it covered. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Well, so yeah, my report's attached. Um, just to continue that narrative, um, we are working with capital accounting partners on a fee audit. I did meet with Dan Eds, is our contractor working with the board. Um, met with him last week. He met with Candace, met with Patty this week, and um, kind of like Anne Marie said, working on the appropriate fees for the actions that we do at the board. Um, it's a 13 month or 13 week contract, so we anticipate there'll be a report back to the board hopefully in July. Other than that, I, I want to highlight that you, the expenditure report is attached. Um, we continue to closely monitor the budget. However, we did see some success with uh, increasing our appropriation for AG and OAH expenses, which is a tremendous help as those continue to increase uh, year over year. Um, we have a BCP as well past this fiscal year to also increase those appropriations and that has been approved. It's We're not the only board of DCA that is under the same type of situation. There's other boards and we were all lumped into one budget change proposal and we we're all successful. So that should be a big relief for our fund condition going forward. If you have any questions, I'd like to answer them. So that means, oh, sorry. Uh, what was the cost of the uh, fee audit? The fee audit contract was Around twenty-one thousand. Is it in the current figures right here somewhere? Is yeah, we've we've accounted for the fee audit in our expense report. I didn't see it in the what summary. It's it's not called on separate line. Item. It's under uh, above the heading departmental services. It's a bold heading. The line Sorry, item above extra. that, two hundred fifty-one thousand. That's the object code where we place the fee audit contract okay. on the on the expense report. Okay, Judy. So then with the BCP that was uh, approved, are all positions that we had safe as far so as? It's a, se it's a separate budget change proposal. Um, that scenario is due for revisiting this uh, season for BCPs. Where we left off with that was the positions were given to us on a permanent tenure, but the funding was limited term. So we're going to ask for those to be funded permanently. Oh, yeah. And in their audits, do they um, do an analysis of what it really costs to develop and conduct? Abs abs that's a big factor. That's it's yeah, it's awesome. it's additional uh, exam development workshops, subject matter experts. It, it's a big pull to do those occupational analysis. And in general, we don't we um, are the fees that are charged uh, to all the registrants. Um, those are just a break even. We don't make money on any of these. Well, I mean, I, I can't say by fee if that's accurate. I will say we're in, operating in a structural imbalance, meaning our exactly. yeah. our expenditures exceed our revenues. So it would be a fair assumption that perhaps we're not charging enough for certain fees. Um, that's what the fee audit's going to do is tell us which of those fees should be increased. Yes, perhaps. Right. Okay. yes, Kathy. <clears throat> Was there in? The, I, I really <coughs> appreciate the idea and the going through with the fee audit because I think that makes sense, especially for the consumers. Yeah. Um, question, is there, ha have we discussed long-term, it seems like that's a natural audit that should happen every few years. And it's an expense, I know, but those do, ch they do change some things. I, I don't know what other boards do, if they in, in pl place that into, you know, say we'll always do one every five years or every two years, or what has this board idea. done before? I'm not aware of any other um, that we've ever done like this now. fee audit. I'm not aware of anyone that since I've been at the board that we've done. Oh, okay. Um, wow. Yeah. So, Kathy, but one it's a of good example. Yeah. yeah. One of the charges of the contractor is to not just look at the fees we need today and five good. years from now, yeah. but we're looking at inflation and growth so that okay. because we have a statutory cap 
And today we have room within our regulations and our statute to increase our fees without going to the legislature. But what we've asked of this third party vendor is to look at at what point are we going to exceed our cap so that we're prepared okay. to address that before we're in the situation we're in today. Okay, that, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So I didn't realize the scope of the article. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Now, did somebody increase our rent? The, <laughs> what happened with that? Ethan, you want to touch that? Oh, uh, I. <laughs> we have a wonderful new office. <laughs> we have more staff. You know, bigger space. Yeah, that was related to our our move. Um, but it, it's, it's still. Yeah, it's been a while yeah. since you moved. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll say this, that, uh, you know, there's a lot of line items in this expense report that are not appropriate for where they, they sit and what we actually uh, are getting costs, have costs for. So it's an effort we're going to do, hopefully, within the next few years to realign our, our budget to be more appropriate to what our expenditures are. I will address the facilities ops, though, which is that's what you're looking at, right? Yeah. Um, so the lease agreement was on an adjustable arm. So it's been adjusted up. So everyone within that building saw a spike because so, of the so lease agreement. Did our yes, they did. <laughs> okay. It's it's part of the lease agreement that we signed. Yeah. Right. yeah. I have one more question. Yeah. Um, the line items that are down below involving uh, the IT and the interagency SVCS is about a hundred thousand, one hundred seven thousand, but nothing has been spent to date. Are those sort of an annual expenditure or? Is that actually a wish list for things you need, or what is that? Breeze uh, updates or something? I'm sorry, I didn't see where you're at. It's down under intra-agency services, so I was assuming someone's going to charge you at some point for those. <laughs> yes, they will. Yeah, yeah, that's my guess. <laughs> these are pro rata yeah. costs. Okay. Yeah. So, so these are set costs that we have to pay to the department for their have, services. They only, do they build them once a year, or they don't? Sometimes we get billing throughout the year. Sometimes we're six months in before we get our pro rata costs before they hit. Kind of think of it like a liquidation it's going to happen you're going to it's going to eventually catch up so there's not a lot of flexibility in pro rata costs because they're set costs that were charged for those services but that does make our bottom line look a little more grim if you're assuming those are going to come well yeah we're, we're accounting for what was appropriated okay. for those line items and again I, I think it's unfortunate that not all line items reflect actual cost areas so yeah. we'd like to clean that up so it's more obvious what we're we'll paying for. And Anne Marie, we're only nitpicking the budget because we don't want you to go to jail. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Jamie, if you look at though the projections to your end on each one of those, sure. they are projected yes. out. Yeah. Yep. So it, it won't change our bottom line because yeah. we're already forecasting them to be spent. Mm -hmm. It just makes our. Um, well, actually, they're not. Pro oh, they're projected out of. Yeah, that last yeah. that, that last projected. column. Yeah. It has a 50 and 57 appropriation assumed to be expended. Projections to year end is zero. There's not on there. No projections to year end on on those. So if you start with departmental pro rata. Yep. The column before the last. So the last column is unencumbered Wait, balance. I'm, on the wrong I'm under interagency services, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Consolidated data center, interagency, information tech. You go over and it says budget um, allotment, 50,000, 57. And then I go over to projections to year end and there's nothing there. I just have unencumbered balance at the far end. Right. So, but see, see next to that unencumbered balance where it says projections to year end, 75,210. And there's a 503, a 257. Okay. The, where are you? She's referred to this. Yeah. Are you going up above? I don't think I have what you have. Oh, you're down below. Yeah, we're yeah. down below. Right. Down that, that's the, well, to Amory's point, that's a pro rata. You don't necessarily have a projection for it. It, it is what it is. We do account for in the last column the that that will be expended for our but appropriation. It's not accounted for in projections to year end. If you it look at it, it should be places. there, I would think. And then end up yeah. So, so, Ethan, it just. It, we, it, yeah, we could put it there. That's. I think it is it is accounted for in our yeah. bottom line. Yeah. It just doesn't show in that column. I was okay, on the right. column up above, so yeah. I see okay. what you're talking okay. about. No worries. I, yeah. I, you know, I just I, you know, it's just nice to see that we have a bit of a surplus, but it's a little bit misleading. If you okay. Look at that. I don't know. Okay. Is it or is that right, Ethan? Is it a bit? If what? you start looking at some of these. If you say it's accounted here, we're still busy. But that's unencumbered balance. That's not. Yeah. I know. But what she's trying to what she's trying to pass off. 
Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> Holy moly this morning. <laughs> what is your deal? <laughs> wow. I'm going to try to pass anything off, my friend. <laughs> Let's start again with that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But, but, but it still doesn't five. balance. It, it does still it. doesn't it balance doesn't. to me. I'm just, my, you know, numbers don't seem to quite jive. Right so, the numbers that are in projections to year end mm -hmm. should reflect this bottom line. In this column, where you don't see them incorporated, yes. that you see them as unencumbered balances. Yes. If we did the math, those still include this five million. 40, 41,000, okay. yes. yes it I get it. Okay. It just, they didn't get moved into that because this, the way this Excel spreadsheet works, anything that's pro rata or expected to be spent gets calculated in that bottom line. It's just you're not seeing the numbers where they're right. supposed to be. They don't, they don't add up necessarily like vertically. Okay. So we can, we can send you by email, and we should, an uh, updated sorry, projection just, so that you have it. But probably. it does incorporate yeah. all these numbers. I see if you put it in here, you want me to look at it. So I, I do. I, I do, and I appreciate yeah. it. It makes yeah, sense no to me sometimes. But. Without the qualification that we're passing it off. <laughs> <laughs> I did not say that. I know. It wasn't you. It wasn't you. It's the fugitive. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, the guy with the warrant? That guy? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? Away, yes, Kathy. <laughs> Ethan, you may have covered this on the initial, but I'm not quite sure. Yes. The um, when you go on the exam expenses, I mean the um, uh, expert administrative. I'm looking at the overages in um, the external expert administrative and ex external expert subject matter. Is that because we? I'm just not sure why we're. We're going to be in the red. What is the, that's? We just didn't get our change proposals for additional staff. It's sixty-one thousand. External. Yeah, and it's sixty-one thousand twenty-nine, and then the second one is a negative, another negative fifty-two thousand against what was originally budgeted. Oh yeah. Right here. Well. I I can't answer the, the negative, but in the uh, current year expenditures column, that reflects uh, contract expenditures. Mm -hmm. That the 4686 in the current year, that's our PSI contract for administering the exam. It's definitely a charge we'll incur. And the external subject matter experts will be our exam SMEs. And okay. so in that current year column, that's the amount expended. I think what Kathy's what asking is, is why weren't we allotted? Why, yeah, why don't we why have a budget for it? For oh, I see. Um, Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's again one of those funny things is that, you know, we still have freight charges that don't apply because we don't administer the exam. So it's part of uh, the fiscal system has been updated when it comes to tracking these kinds of things and we need to realign this. So it, okay. makes, it makes more sense on paper, I, I acknowledge. Okay. It's not always clear yeah, I just was, what yeah, expenditures. Yeah, that's what I was really asking. Okay, yeah. got it. Thank you. Any comments from the public? I don't know. I don't know if Ethan was planning to talk more about uh, the uh, licensing statistics and the exam pass rates, but. Um, uh, Jennifer uh, alluded to the uh, disappointment of the RBT schools and the low passing score. Can we, we'll address yes. that under Ethan's report. Right. Okay, so I will come back. And this talk is about budget. That. Yeah. Okay, should we move on to enforcement? Candace? Good morning. So for enforcement, this past Monday, which was the 17th, we conducted an expert witness training. Um, we had four brand new experts that were being trained at that. I think we overwhelmed them a little bit, but I don't think it was to the point where they won't come back, so that's good news. Um, the morning session was an overview for those new experts. We provided an overview of the board, how we're constructed, what the various 
departments do, and then we provided them, more importantly, with an overview of the expert witness program and kind of what their role in that process is and how that process works beginning to end. And then, as Dr. Waterhouse said in the afternoon, we came together in more of a roundtable fashion. Um, we had presentations from Dr. Jenny Godkin, Gedkin, and Dr. Holly Mullen, um, who are current experts who have now got quite a bit of experience. Dr. Gedkin gave a presentation on report writing, which was fascinating. Um, Dr. Mullen gave a presentation on testimony at hearing, which um, I think she said she's testified three times at hearing. She said two or three. Two or three times. Um, but one of those times was <laughs> we all know that case. epic, to say the least. And so um, she, she had some really informa interesting information to convey, and, and I enjoyed that very much. So um, some really positive feedback for that. As always, um, we have plenty of opportunity for improvement, and um, that's kind of the nature of enforcement. But we're looking forward to implementing some of the um, feedback that we received and the, the suggestions for improvement there. Overall, the feedback that we're receiving is that we're on the right track and that things are improving, and so we're grateful for that. Um, statistics. You have the statistical report in your packet. We are now entering, well, we're in quarter four of this fiscal year, so we're looking at wrapping up um, and looking forward to 17, 18. It's a little bit scary that we're already there. Just a couple of highlights from the statistical report. If you'll look at the complaints received, We've received roughly 750 complaints already this year. We are on track for 1,000 at least, if we continue at the, the pace that we're at now. Last year, I think we were at 800, roughly 850, 860, somewhere in there. So that continues to increase. Um, we continue to meet or exceed our performance measure for average days to complete the investigations that do not result in AG action. For investigations that do result in AG action, um, that's something that we're still above the performance measure of 540 days. But overall, if you look at it, we are at this point in the year at about 854 days. So we continue to improve there as well. Do you have any questions with regard to the statistics? How many um, of the cases that you inherited, there's really long standing cases that you inherited, are there any of those still out there? There are a couple. And there was one that was set for hearing. We were hoping to get that resolved. Um, and they requested a continuance. And that was granted. So I think that goes to hearing in July. So that'll probably, well, it will drag into next year as well. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but in the, the past mail vote, um, there were several yeah. really old cases. Yeah. So yeah. that's another reason why we're kind of up this quarter, but, but that was definitely probably, I think there were at least three that were really old there. So we're getting there. How, how many more? I can think of the, the one I know that was, was still here when I got here. The other thing is there are a couple of other, well, more than a couple, probably five or so older cases that are now at the AG's office um, that when I got here, they were still at the complaint stage. So they weren't necessarily pending AG cases at that time, but they are now and, and they're still older. So, so what are they from like we're 08, working through 09, that. do you know the years? I don't think there's anything that old. I think they're from 2011, 2012. Okay. So. Any questions or comments? No. Uh, staffing update, we are, I hesitate to even say this, but we are currently at full staff in the enforcement unit, knock on wood. Um, so that's great. Uh, Sydney Vorell joined the enforcement unit this past quarter and she's been a valuable asset. She's really kind of just 
come in and, and she's diving in and, and um, doing very, very well. So we're grateful for her assistance. We also have the pleasure of working with two retired annuitants who are individuals who have come in to kind of help us with um, catching up with some backlog, creating procedures, updating briefs, and so forth. So they're with us, scheduled to be with us through the end of June. And um, so we're really grateful for their help. That's it. Unless you have questions, concerns, feedback? Any <laughs> comments from the public? Questions? You're doing okay. a great job, Candace. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Thank it was you. an amazing team. Lift to get expert witness training done the day before the MDC and two days of the yes, MDC. Yes, that's huge. So thank you to you and your staff that Absolutely. pulled it all together. The goal is that next week Betsy and I'll sit down and kind of debrief this expert witness training and get started on the next one so that it's not quite as chaotic. <laughs> is the plan to have them how many times a year? Typic well, what we've been doing is shooting for twice a, twice year, a year, and that seems to be working pretty well. So. And one in the north, one in the south. I, I wanted to say one thing on those expert witness trainings. I've been to three now, and one of them was the very first when I first got on the board. I think it was in 14, um, or fi maybe it was 15. But they have each one has improved tremendously based on quality feedback from really all the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And um, this last one was better than the one last year up here in Sacramento, which was also really much better than the first one. So, I mean, there, there is a great deal of improvement, and I think even after this one, there'll be new new things in the expert witness training at the end of the year or whenever you do the second one in Southern California. So it, it really has problem. been an evolving. And from what I've seen from the expert witnesses, they've never really had this kind of training and feedback before so I think that's why hopefully everything will be improved for both the consumers and the veterinarians and so anyway congratulations you guys have done a very Thank good you. job. I think one of the things is we're not married to a format and so we kind of try to change each of the expert witnesses training to fit the need at that time so any feedback that you have whether it be content or format is welcome. So all the expert witnesses that you have now have they been through at least one training session yes okay. I believe so I think there may be one brand new one that yes. wasn't able to attend this and so that's the that's comments all. that I've heard was that mm -hmm. people who've been doing it for a while said this is fantastic because before they had no training they were just given a case and told to do <laughs> right yeah well and, and I think that you know the ultimate goal growth. is is yeah. consistency and accuracy and I don't know how you accomplish that without getting everyone in the same yes. room and mm -hmm. at the same time Yes, because these are veterinarians. We don't. That's why we have these attorneys sitting right next to us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, thank you. Of course. <coughs> thank you, Candace. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Candace. Um, so we move on to Ethan again. Licensing uh, examination update on the RBT examination validation study. Hello again. Um, okay. So your your reports attached. Um, some highlights of what we did already talk about. We have seen um, quite a few VACSP applications. I, I had mentioned uh, more than 3,000 to date since October 2016. As of, as of March, there were approximately 1,200 VACSPs issued. That number is probably larger now. A couple other highlights I'd like to point out is as Jennifer mentioned, um, we have completed the Occupational Analysis of California RBT Profession. That is on our website. Going forward, we are looking to couple that with the National Occupational Analysis that will wrap up sometime this year and do another comparison study for the board's review. Probably won't be till January 2018 is what we're looking at. The ABSB has just kind of kicked off their process, so as soon as they're done, we're going to work with them cooperatively to compare the two analyses. Uh, lastly, um, we have a new state look and feel model to our website, so we're working to update our website hopefully within the next six months to hopefully make it easier for our consumers and applicants to navigate 
their questions on our website. Um, a couple boards have already adopted the new state look and feel. I, I like it a lot. Um, I, I think we'll we'll definitely see an improvement. Yay. And we're I mean we're also of course going to look to rethink the way our layout works on our website to make it easy for everyone to get what they need. So Ethan? Do you have any questions? Yeah. Dr. Nolan, do you see um, with applications received, are there waves of applications that come in for either the veterinarians or the registered veterinary technicians across the year? Yeah, yeah, we do have spikes throughout the year. Um, for vets, it's because they, they can take the California exam about eight months before they graduate. We do see a spike towards the end of calendar years. Okay. And RVT programs kind of graduate on a regular basis, so you'll see an uh, inflow of applications for sure. So you can't really extrapolate the numbers as of March 2017? That's no, really it, to it's that. way too early to tell. But I will say this, um, over the course of the last several years, we have seen an increase, a, tr a trending up. Of, trending up. Of uh, not only applications received, folks being licensed as well. For both? Yeah. And I, if you'd like, I can provide some kind of uh, graph for you at the next meeting if you'd like to see historically yeah, where, we've, that would be great. where we've come from and where we're headed. Yeah. Okay. Any comments from the public? Questions? My first question would be, with all the uh, applications that you've had for the VA CSPs, have you had to reject any due to convictions for drug or alcohol problems? Uh, so you're talking about for felony? Well, felony well, controlled substances? For, for yeah, okay. all of our applications, we, we don't reject them. Uh, they, they can go through a hearing process if there's an issue with past offenses. VACSP is kind of unique in that um, statute says if you have a felony conviction for cold controlled substances, they're not eligible for licensure. And we've had had a few people that we've made ineligible because of that particular situation. So they have caught some people that have been affected then. That's good. Um, I want to respond to caught. So they're fingerprinted like everybody else, just like RVTs. And so I review the applications that when they come in, and if there's a reason why their history seems to pose a significant risk, they're denied. And then they have an appeals process. Those that are BACSPs that have felony convictions don't qualify. If they have felony drug, drug convictions, they don't qualify for a permit. So that's not even a denial, it's an ineligibility. So to answer your question specifically, have we denied um, VACSP applications? Yes, the same way we deny RVT and VET applications. Uh, and I, I just wanted to bring to your attention, uh, Jennifer mentioned that the RVT schools were, had been disappointed in the pass rate on the California RVT exam uh, last year. Uh, and you'll notice that the pass rate has gone up. And I had brought this to your attention at the October meeting that there was a problem with the uh, published uh, test plan. And it was subsequently corrected in November. And I believe, I, although I can't prove, but I believe that the reason that the uh, exam score has gone up is that the test plan has been corrected and uh, the candidates are now getting the correct information about what's actually on the exam, for which I'm grateful. And uh, I, I don't know if, uh, how many of you pay attention to the statistics of how many licensed RVTs there are, but for many years of this published statistic had been around 5,900. Now the published statistic is 7,900. So I'm very pleased to see that we've discovered we have 2,000 more RVTs in the state of California than we thought we did. And if you look at the number of pr premise permits, we now have over two RVTs for every premise. Uh, there used to be problems every time we'd come and say, well, we need a new RVT job task. And they say, no, you can't have it because there aren't enough RVTs in the state to do that. Well, I think that uh, issue is now moot and we're, we're looking forward to uh, RBTs being uh, integrated into practices and being appreciated for what they do. Any other public comment? Any other questions from the board? Um, should we go
go to actually can I ask a yes. question I, I just Kathy. noticed it I and just it's a question I could possibly to Jennifer and, and to Ethan why is the VT any uh, pass rate generally around 50 or 60 percent it's very hard yeah so it's a hard test is it's multi-state or is there do we require that we require yeah we require the VT &E. um, it's the national exam yeah. I can't speak to why the pass rate is what it is, but okay. Um, but that's it's a apparently a difficult exam. Prerequisite. For, okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. The VT and E plus the California is pre okay. Yes. Got it. Do we know what the national pass rate is? Yeah. yeah. Just don't have it off the top of my head. That would be an interesting we, figure. We get that, yeah, and it's we do. on. Um, yeah. I believe it's on AAVSB's website, it, yeah, public probably. website, yeah. the national. If someone wants to look it up, but we do get the national average. We don't report it because it's not yeah. Yeah, specific not in California, yeah. but we we can get it. I can absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Okay, should we move on to hospital inspection? Well, I just want to say something about the. Are we going to talk about this pass fail rates by school? Well, uh, that was something that Nancy had requested, CARFTA had requested, and I think that it's great to see it and compiled and available to everybody. I just wanted to give credit and say, you know, it looks great. Thank you, James. You're welcome. Okay, now on to hospital inspection. Who's going to do this report? I'll do it. Okay. Anne Marie. Um, so, I think many of you know, um, and those of you that don't know, we do not have funding to complete our 20% inspection goal for this year. So, where we are today is where we are today. Um, we will continue to inspect complaint driven. Um, inspections and those that are on probation but because of funding issues we've had to curtail our routine inspections this year um, one important or I'd say really important aspect of what we're doing from an inspection program standpoint is updating our inspection checklist we've been working with CVMA and comments from just general practitioners on things that are in that inspection checklist that really are difficult to d determine what's intended and we're trying to make it more clear for our hospital inspecting hospital managing licensees what the expectation is because that self-evaluation checklist is supposed to be a tool for them to use so that they can go through and check off those compliance issues in their own hospitals we want this to be as user-friendly as possible and as I would say remedial in terms of understandable for everybody that needs to apply it so um, we're working on changes to our hospital inspection checklist be working with dr. Miller um, so he can help us vet those changes to make sure that they make sense to him because they make sense to us doesn't mean a whole lot unless they make sense to the people that are trying to apply them um, the staff is also working on FAQs for our website for hospital inspections. So our new website will include an independent hospital inspection tab at the top of the page and all things for that program will be under that tab. The checklist, FAQs, um, the top 10, you know, top, top 10 most frequent compliance issues. We're also going to try to develop a webinar on training for hospital inspection um, I've done a training in Fresno on hospital inspection I did a training somewhere else I'm doing another one coming up so I'm also doing training I'm also um, helping with training at local VA BMA chapters to get the message out there on what our expectations are I take an inspector with me because I don't really know that much and they do so it's a good idea to have an inspector alongside that answers questions from many of the veterinarians that really are trying to improve their, their practices. Any questions on the stats? 
Judy. So what are we doing specifically to get the money to uh, keep the uh, hospital inspections at 20 percent? So the recent change we talked about in SB 546 mandating that we inspect 20 percent of the hospitals will help us with our budget change proposal because we can go back to the Department of Finance and say this is a legislative mandate. This isn't discretionary. But I thought that's what the whole VACSP bill did. No, it, it suggested that the board inspect 20% of its hospitals. And in fact, the language is in there. You could look it up. It says something to the extent that we should make an attempt to get there. Um, the VACSP money did not just go to hospital inspections. It went to the staff to handle the VACSP program. Right, it was meant for both. I remember that, yeah. There definitely was not enough money for doing 20% of the hospital and hospitals that are currently registered. And if you look at our statistics on premises, it's increased quite a bit, yeah, I saw that. twofold. Mm -hmm. So it will not double. But we do get, um, on average, two to 300 new premise applications a month right now. So yeah, I'm not sure what the spike is about, but wow. Ethan and I just talked about this yesterday because we wanted to kind of have an, a handle on how many new hospitals would have to be inspected based on this new legislation. Two to three hundred a month. Two to three hundred new hospital hospitals registering. Ten a day. A year. Ten a day. Yeah. Every, Every year. year. I'm oh, sorry. Did I say a month? Okay. Every year. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah. Every month. There. Every year. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. <laughs> it's, it's the third day. Um, yeah, every year we're getting two to 250 to 300 new hospitals. Sorry. Yeah, that's an, not that's a month. Quite an increase on its own, let alone be monthly. Yeah. So if you if you see at the bottom, it's our anticipated expenditures. Um, we're already at 144, and actually that's that's actually beyond because this was as of March 31st. Do you know how many don't renew? Like how many? I think it's in our licensing stats. Cancel. You mean in net? Are we yeah. netting like a, a average? I don't think we have as many that cancel. And you've got and the interesting thing about hospital. Does that affect the budget proposals if there's like more hospitals every year? Like make that comparison. So restate your question. Like you mean if there's as many closing as coming online, or if there's more coming online than, yes. Yes, if there's more coming online than those that are not paying their renewal fees, absolutely, it would help. Use that statistic with your So yeah, we have to provide all the data, and usually we try to show three to five year data on trends. So how many hospitals did we have in 2012, 2013 versus where we are today? That number in and of itself will reflect active premises permits, and that will show the, the progression. Right. Yeah. Anything that we can do to yeah. help us. Right. So there's a difference between an active and an inactive, and what we'll show is the active premises that need to be inspected, and as long as that trend shows a progression upward, then clearly we're having, yeah, we're, we have more hospitals to deal with now than we did three years ago. Right, for uniforms for our inspectors, yes. Mm -hmm. I have yeah. So when the updates to the um, hospital standards uh, checklist occur, will we see those updates? Does the board get to see those? Right. So. Those will be published, um, and we will be disseminating those. They'll be available on our website as well. So I would like to see those. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I would like to make a comment about my recent hospital ride-along. It was fantastic. I thought the inspector did a very, very good job. I was pleasantly surprised to see that it was very informational. It was not nearly as, you know, punitive and kind of, you know, awkward as I thought it might be. Um, and I mean, I, and that the remark I made earlier was in no way to criticize the inspector. I just think it, that they need to have some guidance with that. But it was, uh, I think they they really this one did a very good job. Thank you. And I, I'd like to second that. I had a really positive ride along experience with an inspector who I thought was very clear and educational in his approach, and very patient and compassionate, and did a good job of making me seem like wallpaper, which is what I thought needed to be the case. So. And I'll, I would say one other thing on the inspectors. The other thing that um, 
I believe that they have been trained more in and are very sensitive to is these are surprise inspections which for the consumer are terrific and we need to increase them in the 20 percent and assuming we assume the legislature will fund that or, or at least mandate it but uh, they know they're interrupting uh, when they're going into a practice that they're in the middle of the day, there's patients, there's, you know, and the ones, the one I've been with a couple of times has always been very help. You know, he understands. It's not like I'm marching in, sh stop everything. And, and I think that both sets the right tone for the overall experience for the practice staff. And also, um, I think helps with the customers that are in there and the clients and everything else because you can't just shut a place down while you're walking around so anyway I was impressed with that the vet police I've heard the vets referred to it as the vet police any comments from the public shut up I have Grant Miller CVMA uh, it's not in direct relation to inspections, but uh, we're at the end of everything, so there's nowhere it fit in. I wanted to um, uh, give uh, the staff props at the board for their work on publishing a statement relating to marijuana use in pets. That we are aware that there is no position statement from the board, but um, this is a very hot topic issue in the veterinary world now, given the changes in. Are we on camera? Yeah. <laughs> Lower down. Given the changes in California law relating to personal use of marijuana, there's been spikes in the number of toxicities we've seen in practice. And um, the board took some time to compile all of the laws and regulations relating to cannabis, especially those from the DEA, which is a rather cryptic federal organization. And um, they published a um, position statement on the website. And that has been very useful, not only for the profession, but I think for consumers as well, because it shows very clearly what the laws allow and don't allow in relation to that. And so for that, I'd like to thank you. And I, I really appreciate that the board took the time to do that, even though there was no mandate. Thank you. And that, that might be something we put on the future agenda, because, I mean, I'm hearing about it a lot. People are just, it's going crazy. People are treating everything. You guys already know that. Any other comments? Okay, moving on. Future agenda items and next meeting dates. Anne Marie, you want to? Sure. So um, we are still scheduled to meet in Sacramento July 26th and 27th, and then in Fresno in October. Um, we have some ag agenda items from the MDC meeting yesterday, I think, that we needed to consider. Um, those items will be added to our meeting agenda accordingly. Uh, the animal rehab issue was also an issue that was requested to be specifically on our July agenda. Um, marijuana is another uh, addition that um, I appreciate Dr. Miller's comments. It is something that's on our radar and we're getting a lot of um, interest not only from the public but also the Department of Consumer Affairs, and I don't want to go into too much detail because I'll be off topic, but regulates the um, Bureau of Medicinal Marijuana. And so the dispensaries um, have perhaps been selling pet products that are medicinal. And we need to be able to work with our Bureau on how we regulate this. And I think it's a really important issue. I would like to see the board consider it for a future agenda. Um, we Boards, had a board size. What, what, board size. Board size. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, Dr. Waterhouse has requested that we look at the board size and structure again um, because of our licensing population, our additional programs, and some new mandates. Uh, we may not be appropriately sized in the size and structure that we need to be in, and that really does speak to, you know, funding and things for the board, so we need to revisit that. Um, strategic plan, we want to be able to provide you an update on our strategic plan in terms of our accomplishments because the board has done a lot the last few years. <clears throat> and we've been able to check a lot of boxes, so it's good to go over that and look at our action item <laughs> list and see where we are. Do you think the board is currently too big or too small? Too small. 
Um, we uh, classification. Yeah, not members. not members. Yeah, okay. yeah, not the board members. Good did distinction. You, did you just call me that? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. There's so many. All right, where was it? Oh, the RVT exam validation study is scheduled for the next meeting, and that will also um, probably fold into. Carvda had requested that we look at the RVT exam. Um, program in its entirety that would fold into that discussion. We could talk about pass rates, but we will be providing an update to the um, RVT examination validation study and the transition to the VTE. Anybody had anything else? Yeah, I think we should go back to page 12 of 15 of our of our oh, yeah. meeting notes. There's a list of there agenda is. items, including the fee audit recommendations, which might be ready by then. So the fee audit's on there, yeah. The, uh, facility DEA licenses was on that. And we, so there's a few other items um, out of our last minutes. Yeah. The telemedicine's on there, so it just it's, makes the list look very long, but I just thought we had to throw those in. To so we discussed 2027.5 proposed language and legal right. opinion, right. so that's done. Um, telemedicine is scheduled to be on our next um, board meeting agenda. We handled the follow-up from the VACSP. Um, we considered, we have not considered the statutory change to eliminate the veterinary licensing or law exam. Um, that is up for consideration. Doesn't necessarily have to be on the July agenda, but it is something that we need to close the loop on. We did the follow-up to the disciplinary guidelines. The fee audit recommendations, as Ethan mentioned today, should be ready by July. And the other outstanding issue, this facility DEA licenses, we talked about um, the prospect of having a facility license because that is something that's available federally, yeah. but you have to implement it state by state if that's what your state chooses to do. And that is a statutory change because it would have to give an actual premises the ability to um, order and distribute drugs out of the facility, not based on an individual practitioner. Sure. So that is a discussion that this board had indicated an interest in. So that should be placed on a future agenda. Um, again, I think with the priorities that we have before us, and I apologize for missing telemedicine, telemedicine, the fee audit, the animal rehab, and the few MDC recommendations that you asked that were put on the next agenda. The agenda for July is probably fairly full at this point. But if there's a request to move the RVT occupational analysis is on there, if there's a request to reprioritize, now would be the time. Uh, I don't necessarily have a request to reprioritize, but I wanted to add a couple of things for whenever we can get them on the agenda. Okay. Um, one of them was from my report, the um, consideration of pathways for foreign educated RVTs. And I know the ball is in the AAVSB's court, but I, I just want it to be on there. Um, and then the other was the public comment, the letter that we received about yeah. um, tattooing spayed and neutered animals. I'd like at some point to address that. That was, yeah. thank you, thank Jennifer. You. That was, I wanted to get that as well because I know that is an issue that they're open, opening up animals that have been spayed and neutered way too often. Okay, anything else? This is also, I, I'd like to just add, I don't think it's necessary and it, and it has to fit in when we either have the data and when there's time on the agenda. But uh, I, as a member of the ICVA, the International Council of Veterinary Assessments, they did a national and Canadian survey, practitioner survey, and hopefully, and the statistics are really robust, and hopefully they'll, I can present what those results are once sure. it's all mm -hmm. been crunched. They got a 35% return, which is huge. Huge. Yeah. yeah. Give me the acronym again. I'm Kathy? hoping the, pardon? The acronym again. It's ICVA. ICVA. It was NBVNE. Right. Yeah. Um, but, and they worked with the um, National Medical Examiner, uh, examiners, National Board of Medical Examiners, to do the number crunching and the data and the survey. Um, it was very well planned, very well thought out, took a long time to even create it, and then to, yeah, I think it went out last year in 16, and so they're still working on the results. 
That would be interesting. The very last um, item, but I actually would consider this more of an update that Ethan will be able to provide in his licensing report, he talked about it a little bit today, is the retroactive fingerprinting of individuals that were not fingerprinted at the time of initial licensure. So we are moving forward with implementing that. We already have statutory authority to do so. This is really just a breeze programming issue that we're trying to resolve so that we can implement this. But it is on your... Um, review for ne or for action items, I want to assure you that we will be giving you a report on the status of the, the progress. Is that veterinarians and RBTs? Yeah. Any comments from the public? Any other questions? Okay. Sorry. But we don't have a judge until 11. Yes, um, the judge will be here at can, 11. Can we go we'll check we'll out then? Oh, maybe we can take a break. Take a yeah. break. Can we take okay. a break yeah. and go take check out and do that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Cold. Good yeah. idea. At least I, what are we doing? I don't know. Emory, who to give this to? Ethan. Session of the Veterinary Medical Board back into order again. And now we're going to hear the petition for reduction of penalty by Yvonne Asegueda. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And Judge Scarlett is here to um, hear the case. And I'll turn it over to Judge Scarlett. Okay, I'm here to hear the case with the board. The board is actually here in the case this morning. Good morning. How is everyone? Very good. Uh, we're getting ready to, Madam Court Reporter, we'll be ready to go on the record. Okay, we're on the record in the matter of the petition for early termination of probation filed by Yvonne Asigueda. Uh, this matter has been assigned to the Office of Administrative Hearings, case number 2017-040370. Today's date is April 20th, 2017. My name is Michael Scarlett. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings, and I have been assigned to sit with the Veterinary Medical Board uh, to hear this case. At this time, I would like to take the appearances for the record, starting with the Attorney General's office. Good morning. My name is Diane Sokoloff. I'm a supervising Deputy Attorney General, and I'm appearing on, I'm appearing on behalf of the people of the state of California, pursuant to Business and Professions Code Section 4887 and Government Code Section 11522. Would you announce yourself, Ms. Asegueda? Asegueda. Um, I'm Yvonne Osayela, and I'm here to reduce my penalty on my probation. Okay. Now, I know that the board uh, told me that they've already introduced themselves, but I think for the transcript and for the record, I'd like to have the board members introduce themselves individually at this time, starting with the president. Cheryl Waterhouse. Let's go this way. Lee Heller. Jennifer Laredo. Kathy Bowler. Judy Mancuso. <coughs> Welcome, Yvonne. Uh, Jamie Noland. Mark Nunez. Yes, Sullivan. <clears throat> okay, now, are there any board members who are in need of recusing him or herself from this hearing this morning? No? No. Okay, I think we've had an indication that all, all members are, at, are available to, um, to, to uh, participate in this proceeding. Now, I'd like to have Ms. Asiguido raise your right hand, please. We're going to swear you in. Ms. Asiguedo, do you solemnly swear and affirm at the penalty of perjury that the testimony you give here this morning will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Please keep your voice up for us this morning. I know I've got one of these booming voices that rings out across the room. <laughs> but it will have no problem hearing me, but she may have a little problem hearing you, okay? Okay. Now, although I know that you do have the burden in this case, and what I do want to do is give a few proper admonishments for you this morning. Since you are representing yourself here today, let me explain a little bit about the procedure we will be following. The burden of proof is on you to establish that you are entitled to early termination of probation. The Deputy Attorney General will first offer the jurisdictional documents, including your petition and any documents you submitted in support of the petition. She will then make an introductory statement explaining your license history and the history of the violation. You will then be given an opportunity to present evidence to the board. 
if you have any documents that were not already provided to the board and included in the packet submitted by the Deputy Attorney General, you may offer them uh, at this time. You may also testify on your own behalf. You may call witnesses to testify for you. Members of the board and the Deputy Attorney General will probably have questions for you and your witnesses, if you call witnesses, when you are your witness testifying. You have the right to raise legal objections to any questions posed to you or your witnesses. To do so, you must state the basis of your objection, and I will make a ruling on that objection. In making your presentation, you should keep in mind that the board has read your petition, reviewed all documents submitted, and reviewed the underlying discipline orders. It is not necessary to represent that evidence here. What the board is primarily interested in is evidence of rehabilitation, although the board may also ask questions regarding the underlying discipline. However, if it, if it does not do so, it is not necessary to discuss the underlying discipline in this proceeding. Also, in order to ensure that all petitioners have an opportunity, well, we only have the one petition, so I don't have to worry about that this morning. We're not going to put a time limit on you. Well, we may. <laughs> After, uh, after your petition has been heard, the board will meet in closed session for, deli uh, for deliberations. The board's decision will not be announced today, however, uh, and, will be, and uh, or will be announced after the public session resumes. What will happen is a written, the, the board will instruct me and I will prepare a written decision based on the board's determination of the issues in closed session and that will be mailed to you as soon as possible. Do you have any questions about the procedure today? No, I don't. Okay. At any time during the hearing, you have a procedural, if you have a procedural question, please feel free to <coughs> stop us and ask us whatever that question is that you may have, okay? Okay. All right, now, um, okay, so Ms. Sokoloff, you may proceed. All right. I would first like to mark for identification and offer into evidence Exhibit 1, um, which includes the, unless you already have a copy, or it's a copy of the hearing notice, the license certification, and the uh, petitioner's packet. I do not have a copy. I'd like those to be marked for identification as complainants Exhibit 1, or excuse me, as the um, people's Exhibit 1. Collectively, the entire packet as Exhibit 1? Yes. Okay. Unless you would like me to break it down into three separates? No. Okay. No. That'll be fine. The board members and petitioner have been provided with a copy of this exhibit, and the documents total 33 pages. The documents, uh, approximately 33 pages. The documents consist first of the notice to appear dated April 5th, 2017. It's a two-page document. Next in order is the license certification dated April 6, 2017. And third is the packet um, prepared by the Veterinary Medical Board, including, uh, could we just go off record for one second? Yes. Um, do you have a copy of this? Okay, just wanted to make sure. Okay, well let's make sure we do that on the record. And make right. sure she does have a copy of what's been marked as Exhibit 1. Back on the record. I, uh, I, I, okay, I thought I said that she had have been provided a copy, but I just wanted to. Just to make sure. Okay. For the record, she, uh, the petitioner has been provided a, a, a copy of what's been marked as Exhibit 1. Is that correct? Correct. That's awesome. Thank you. The documents of the packet prepared by the Veterinary Medical Board consist of a picture of respondent, her four-page petition for reduction of penalty, and this is all in order. A notarized character reference letter from Amy Krieger, spelled K-R-I-E-G-E-R, dated December 21st, 2016. Another notarized character reference letter from Valerie Buelo, B-U-E-L-O, undated, but notarized on December 27, 2016. A page of photographs, 
a notarized letter to the board from Ms. Asequeda, O-S-E-Q-U-E-D-A, dated November 29th, 2016. A receipt for payment of membership to SCVMA, dated November 12th, 2015. A receipt for payment of membership to NAVTA, NAFTA, dated 12 14, 2016. Another letter to the board from Ms. Asequeda, Asequeda dated 11 29 16. Three copies of her pay stubs dated November and December 2016, and I'm going to get back to that in a minute. Respondent State of Nevada licensure certification, and I should actually say petitioners. State of Nevada license certification, a certificate certificate of attendance of Dog Beach Dentistry dated June 11th and 12th, 2016, continuing education certificate for CPR lecture and lab dated November 15th, 2015, a continuing education certificate for IDE X is an X-ray X is an X-ray. Guide to Diabetes, dated 12-13-2015, and a reference letter from Julian Austin, dated May 29th, 2015. Now, just going back to the copies of her pay stubs, dated November and December 2016, I think it best that those be um, admitted under seal in light of government code sections 6254 sub N and 11507.6, which essentially indicates that this information should be kept confidential. Um, and so that's what I believe should occur with that documentation. Um, however, it can still be used um, by the petitioner here. I just think in terms of the um, maintenance of the documentation and the record keeping for the board, it should remain um, confidential. Okay. Are, are you concerned about the fact that we're in a public proceeding? If there's anything discussed about those particular pay stubs, should that be redacted from the transcript as well? Um, How do you want to handle that? I have no problem sealing the three documents. Right. Or the board should have no problem sealing that. We could take care of that uh, once I've obtained the packets back. Well, um, statements of personal worth, which are filed by the applicant <clears throat> for qualification of licensure, should not be disclosed by the board. And um, I believe then just to be extra careful that maybe the information that is contained in the record or any transcript thereafter should probably be sealed or put under some sort of form of protective order, just to be sure. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Now I'm prepared to offer a summary of the case. Thank you. You may proceed. All right. And if I'm pronouncing this wrong, please correct me, but is it Ms. Asequeda? Osigueda. Yeah. Osigueda. Osigueda. Um, so Ms. Osigueda submitted an application for being a veterinary medical technician, um, for li being a licensed veterinary <coughs> medical technician on January 23rd, 2015. <coughs> In that application, she disclosed that she had two DUIs, driving under the influence, convictions from Nevada. One was in August 14, 2009, and the other was in May 21, 2012. Petitioner, who at that point was considered a respondent, she entered into a stipulation with the California Veterinary Medical Board, wherein the board agreed that upon respondent's completion of all requirements for licensure, the board would issue her a three-year probationary license under several terms and conditions, which included participation in alcohol or drug, or in an alcohol or drug rehabilitation program, submitting to drug testing, 
abstaining from drug and alcohol use, and taking an ethics course. And this is, these are typical um, probationary terms beyond the standard terms when the violation or cause for concern occurred something related to alcohol or drugs, which in this case it was because that was, there were two um, DUIs. So she entered into this stipulation and that became effective June 15, 2015. And the probationary license allowed respondent to take an exam for registration, in which she did, and she was issued registration number 11063 on June 14, 2015. Thus, her three-year probation began on June 24, 2015. So respondent has been on probation for approximately a year and nine months. So she has a balance of approximately a year and three months. In that case, she's a little over halfway through her probationary period. On December 29th, 2016, Ms. Asegueda submitted a petition for reduction of penalty. In support of her petition, she identifies rehabilitative efforts which, including, which includes attending a drug and alcohol abuse program once or twice every other week and taking a continuing education classes, at least three of them, which were discussed previously um, in connection with the information that was attached to her probation or to her petition. She adds a letter from Amy Krieger, the medical director um, of a veterinary medical practice where she is, was employed, which indicates that petitioner has good moral character, integrity, she's responsible, she has high medical standards, she's trustworthy, hardworking, and a dedicated model employee. Another letter from Valerie Bueno, who is a small animal practitioner who works with respondent indicates that or excuse me, who works with petitioner, indicates that petitioner has a great work ethic, has a great personality, performs normal responsibilities, purchases medical supplies, updates their social media pages, and has a patient care focus. Another letter from Jillian Austin, who is a veterinarian, worked with respondent and indicates that, worked with petitioner, sorry, and indicates that she has a high skill level, is a mentor, is a trainer, has compassion, empathy, and um, strongly supports the petitioner's effort to reduce her penalty. Respond, uh, the, the petitioner also wrote a letter on her own behalf. She discusses her rehabilitation efforts, her work responsibilities, the fact that she volunteers at work shelters, that she's a member of trade groups and associations. Um, her, she indicates that her struggle with the probationary process is in large part financial. Her monthly bills add up to approximately $1,800, not including her probation fees, and her pay stubs indicate that she er earns um, about $2,060 per month. And with that information in the summary, I'm prepared to just um, complete my comments right now until after petitioner uh, testifies and then ha have the opportunity to ask for some follow-up thereafter. Why don't we try and take, uh, with regards to your exhibits, exhibit <coughs> one, you want it to have it identified as the entire packet, but would it be better to have the board's packet identified as exhibit two? Because I'm going to ask Ms. Oswego. Oswega? Osegeda. 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 My apologies. I'm it's front okay. Because I, Osegeda, whether or not she objects to the, to, to, um, the board's packet. The board's packet. That's fine. So just to, for clarification, Exhibit 1, not only it's, it's the notice and the license certification and petitioner's packet, 
Right. And then exhibit two is the board's packet. Okay, let's do it that way. Okay, so I'm going to ask Ms. Aceguedo whether or not you have any objections. Well, number one, have you reviewed what's been identified as exhibit one, which I'm assuming was documents you provided to the board. Is that correct? Yes. So well, you, no? it's documents that she provided in addition to that, it's the notice of this hearing okay, today correct, and it's correct. her license certification. Okay. Do you have any objections to admitting what's been marked as Exhibit 1 into evidence? No. Okay, Exhibit 1 is admitted into evidence. Okay, I have a question. Sure. Um, um, just a point of clarification. Uh, is the probationer not the respondent? Is that it's a petitioner. petitioner. The petitioner um, applied for uh, an application to be a registered veterinary technician. You had said to be an application for a veterinary medical technician, which doesn't exist. Oh, then I misspoke. So it's just a point of clarification. She, the application is for a registered, for a registered veterinary, veterinary technician. technician. Your presentation said it was for a veterinary medical technician, which doesn't exist. Oh, okay. Thank for you the <laughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> okay. Again, any objections to admitting what's been identified as Exhibit 1? No. Okay. Exhibit 1 is admitted into evidence. Exhibit 2, which is the uh, petition for reduction of penalty, uh, as well as the stipulation for a probation license. <coughs> Do you have any objection to admitting those two documents into evidence? No. Okay. Exhibit 2 is admitted into evidence. Okay. Now, with that being said, now is the time, I think, to have the petitioner uh, testify at this, at this point and tell us if you recall when I was given the admonition for persons who are represented, uh, who are representing themselves, what the board is interested in hearing about in this, in this proceeding is what you've done in the last one year and nine months since you've gone on probation to rehabilitate yourself from the underlying disciplinary conduct, i.e. the DUIs and the reason we're here today. So if you could tell us that you're under oath, I'm going to allow a narrative <coughs> for you to take some time. No one's going to ask you any questions right now. I'm going to allow you a narrative first to tell us what you want the board to hear. And then I'll turn it over to Ms. Sokoloff and the board if they have any questions for you. Okay? Okay. All right. You um, may proceed. Okay. So for the past year and nine months, I have been going to AA meetings um, every other week. Um, and also, I've been going to help rescue shelters and volunteer, and also with my community, volunteering in vaccine clinics. Um, I'm the only registered technician in my practice, so I do take the initiative to go to many CEs to train my other teammates and um, just to keep them up to date on everything. Um, I do have more responsibilities as my other teammates, such as making sure inventory is proper, um, medical supplies are ordered, um, and just make sure the whole floor is running smoothly. Um, I'm very busy mainly trying to pursue what I want to do my next level in my career. I want to um, specialize in dentistry, and I've been really looking more into that, and I've just been really busy doing that than anything else. all I have to say. Okay. Ms. Sokolov? All right. So where do you currently work? I work at VCA in Hermosa Beach, California. And how many, how many veterinarians work there? Three. And you said you're the only RVT there? Yes. What are the other people who you mentioned who are on your team? What is their status? They're veterinary assistants. Do you supervise them? 
No, there is a veterinary super, supervisor that's, um, she's been there for years, so it's more because um, of experience. Okay. And how long have you been there? I've been there about a year and a half. <clears throat> Where were you before that? Before that, I was working with Banfield. Um, Banfield in West Los Angeles. I transferred from Banfield in Reno, Nevada to there. And what is Banfield? Uh, Banfield is, um, it's a veterinary clinic inside PetSmarts. Okay. Is that Banfield or Ban? Ban as in boy. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. And were you a, an RVT there? Yes. Who were, was any of the letters that you submitted in your packet from any of the employees or veterinarians at Banfield? Yes, that would be Dr. Um, Dr. Austin. <clears throat> and what was the purpose of Dr. Austin's letter? The purpose for her letter was when I first applied for, um, for my license for California, um, and then just to verify everything that I am a good person to begin with before starting the probation. Okay. And then were the other two letters from, that you submitted in your packet from people who were employed at VCA Hermosa? Yes. Okay. And, and who were they again? Um, Dr. Krieger and Dr. Bueno. And have you been convicted of any crimes since you've been on probation? No. Have you been stopped for a DUI since you've been on probation? No. Were you ever addicted to alcohol or drugs? No. Did you, have you taken any additional um, continuing education courses other than the ones that you have attached to your petition package? During my probation, no. Have you been keeping up with, with your required um, CE courses and other other types of requirements for your RVT license? Yes. And what have you been doing besides the continuing education courses to keep you up to date on developments in your field? I guess other than the continuing education and maybe the volunteering, volunteer work that you've been doing, if anything. Mm -hmm. Do you read any periodicals? No, um, I do get emails and um, my work does have a learning portal that we've been using. And what, could you describe the learning portal in a little bit more detail? Um, there's online training courses um, such as dental radiographs that I've completed. Um, and safety and hazard. Do you receive certifications after you've completed those courses? Yes. And so do you have the certifications? I do have them. But you just didn't submit them? No. Okay. So how many additional certifications do you have other than the ones that you've submitted in your packet other, and, and other than these two that you've mentioned? Other than those two? Right. Since you've been on probation. Oh. Um, at least two more. Okay. So, sounds like you have your CE courses that you've submitted <coughs> in your packet, plus an additional four other types of courses that you've taken and received certifications for. Is that correct? Correct. And what have you gained from your probation so far? I gain um, more knowledge um, of knowing 
how to become a, um, a better technician, how to use more resources in educating myself um, and updating myself, um, and pretty much looking, making sure someone is looking up to me and just becoming the best that I can. Um, every since my last DUI, I feel like I've planned out a lot more than before. I've been very careful um, in deciding what I'm going to do when I go out. I always plan ahead and make sure everything's planned out. And I feel like I still continue to, to that at this point. Okay. Um, in your letter, you indicated that one of the main reasons why you're seeking a reduction of penalty um, is the financial hardship that it imposes on you. And you gave some, some, some figures which would indicate, I think there was about a between a two and three hundred dollar differential between what you earned and your basic life expense expenses. But you also said that that didn't, in, that didn't include your expenses that you identified in your letter didn't include your probationary expenses so, per month. So I think that's an important fact to include in, in this presentation. So do you have an idea of what your monthly probation expenses are? Yes, um, they run about 350 a month. <coughs> All right, so given that figure, that would indicate that you, you're you possibly running at a, a negative for at least $50 a month, given the figures that you gave. And this is approximate, but is, is that about correct? Yes. Um, and that doesn't even include any entertainment or, or anything other than just housing, food, shelter expenses plus probation? Yes. <coughs> I don't have anything further at this point. Okay. Um, shall we open it up to the board? Questions <coughs> by the board? How do we proceed? Questions? Dr. Nunez. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for coming before the board. I know that it could be um, intimidating, and I'm always, uh, I always admire people that come before the board to petition their, their case. Um, but I just have a couple of questions. Uh, in previous petitioner's package, you, we've had some examples of attendance. So you, you, you say that you've been to AA meetings once or twice a week, every other week. Um, other petitioners have included sign-in sheets or documentation or proof that they've been to AA meetings. Why didn't you submit anything like that? I haven't been keeping copies, and that's my fault, um, but I have been submitting them quarterly. And that, that's, that's something that was submitted you, to the board? You're saying submitting, you've been submitting them to whom? To the board. Okay. So the board has documentation that she has been attending the AA meetings. I'm not a rep. I don't. I have. I don't have that documentation. Okay. I'm sure that can be fleshed out um, today before it's submitted. If you would like that to be done, um, I can look into that. I mean, if, if I mean, I don't need a, the actual document in front. But maybe Candace say if there is is that part of a probationary. Of what a probationer looks for is documentation of that. <coughs> That's what I was going to say. So, okay. so I was just going to get some documents to look at some facts. So, if you look at the stipulated settlement, okay, which is going to have the terms, generally speaking, one of the terms is that she has to be attending and submit rep, rep, reports. Okay. The presumption is if she hasn't been indicated as violating her, 
probationary term. That is, and I would know that. Okay. Then <coughs> the assumption is that, that she is complying. Okay. She's in compliance. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The only reason why I ask is that previous petitioners have included that in their package, but that's not going to be held against her as long as she's in compliance. The other question I have <coughs> is um, the terms of the probation include drug testing, um, even though your convictions were just for uh, DUIs. Um, you've never, you've never used drugs. Your 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 substance abuse is just with alcohol. Yes, I never used drugs. Okay. The um, the last question I have is, and I try to ask this of all the petitioners that come before us, is. I'm a veterinarian, and I love my profession, and I respect my profession greatly. And when a client brings their pet to me, they're trusting me with their beloved pet, with their family member. And I take that as a great responsibility, that I need to be competent, and I need to be fully capable of taking on that responsibility. And that's something that I expect all license holders, whether or not they be veterinarians or RVTs, to do the same. In other words, we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard because the work that we do is so important. And that's why you've been placed on probation to have this license. The fact that you've allowed yourself to submit to these drug testings and so forth does speak volumes to, about you, that you've committed yourself, that you've dedicated yourself, um, because you want to be an RBT, and that's admirable. But what I'm looking for in, um, as justification to reduce your penalty <coughs> is maybe not so much that you've taken CE courses to improve your knowledge of being an RBT, but specifically, have you come to terms with the issues that made you have an issue with alcohol in the first place? Have you dealt with those issues and do you know why it happened? And can you assure me that it's not going to happen again? Yes, um, I have dealt with those issues before. Um, and I can assure you it won't happen again because just how you love your profession, so do I, and it's what I am, a technician. I don't see myself anything else. Um, I don't want to risk that. Um, having my license is everything for me, and I'll, if there's something to jeopardize that, I make sure that it won't happen. Um, yeah. I've gone, when I did get my second one, <coughs> I've gone through counseling, and that made me see how I can do other things, socialize other ways, and just to avoid being that situation. Um, since then, I've been very careful, and I've been more responsible and planning my way about. So AA has taught you just to be more careful? No. AA taught me different I've listened through many stories and how other people got their way of solving their problems um, with religion or their family members. Um, but through me, when I went through counseling, it helped me a lot more um, just because they explain how you can avoid the situations that way. Okay. May I just follow up on uh, one of Dr. Nunez's questions before we leave that point. With regards to the rehabilitation program, within 30 days of the effective date of the stipulation, you were to enroll or begin a rehabilitation program. And the, the term states that she was, it sort of leaves it open here, she was going to participate for the duration of probation or for one year or for two years, and I'm not quite sure whether or not that's been specified or whether it was made clear to her by your probation officer, whether it would be for the duration of probation, for the first year, the second year. Does 
do you have an understanding of what that is? Um, I never got a clarification of, for the duration, um, but I just kept going until and I possibly could. And what you could. are referring to as your rehabilitation program is your attendance at the AA meetings uh, every other week, twice a week. Correct. And that's what you are referring to as your rehabilitation program? Yes. Okay. Do you have any clarification on that, Ms. Sokol? Um, I don't have any clarification on that, but I do have clarification on the issue before, which just so that we the record's clear, what we were talking about was on page five of her stipulation with discuss the rehabilitation program. Right. And it said that in quarterly written reports to the board, she had to provide documentary evidence of continuing continuing satisfactory participation in this program. Right. That was going to be my second part of the course. Okay. Okay. So those are important for purposes of establishing whether or not you have been complying with probation. Okay. And the assumption is that she has been. Okay. okay. Hi. Um, I've got two questions for you. Um, you refer to that you're, you plan things out better. So if you could describe a situation and tell us what plans things out better means, that would be really helpful to us to be more descriptive as to how you are avoiding these situations and how things have changed for you since those DUIs and now. So being a little more descriptive would be really helpful to us. Uh, also, can you break down that $350 that you spend uh, a month? Where does that money go? So two questions. Okay, so the first question is when I say I plan out my days better, it, what I mean is I think about how am I going to get home, who's going to take me home, and or do I have money in my pocket to get home? Those are what I think about before I leave my house. Um, I feel like now I don't go out as much, um, so it makes it a lot easier for me to plan out my days. And now we have Uber and other alternatives to get home. So then what you're saying is when you go out and you have drinks socially, you take Uber, are you saying that when you're drinking, you have a plan on how you're driving, is that it? Or are avoiding drinking? I, I'm confused as to what it means exactly. It means when I go out and socialize, not necessarily I'm planning on drinking. It's mostly if I'm gonna go out with friends, I'm gonna have them pick me up or have some sort of way of getting there besides me driving. Okay, and why would you do that? Because I wanna avoid me driving any way if just... So just, if you have a drink maybe, then you, you wanna avoid driving, is that it? Yes, just to cover any situations like that. Um, your second and the question. Yes, the, the 350. 350. I do pay every time I go for a drug test. I pay what they require at the medical center. Um, How much is that? It's 40. <clears throat> After that, I do get paid when they receive the lab results at every end of the month. And it depends how often I go, it's randomly selected. Um, and then on top of that, my monthly um, payment for the probation, which is 100. So that turns into about 140. I get randomly tested every other week or once a week or twice a month. It varies. Okay. So it's about maybe 160 a month if it's or, or maybe $80 a month? Yeah. And and, then, oh, sorry. $80 okay. a month. And then you a hundred, and then um, I get charged when results <coughs> get scented, and that's a, that's sixty dollars per test. Okay. So these tests, this is testing for alcohol and drugs, or just alcohol? Do you know? I don't know. Um, when I check in, it tells me to 
choose option one, which I'm not very familiar with what that means. Okay, and ha have you ever failed a test? Not in my knowledge. Have you ever missed a test? I have gone on trips. I've, I've notified my probation supervisor about these trips. Um, I wasn't aware if I had to keep checking either if I'm not in the states or the country. So those days I did explain myself um, through a letter. Um, but other than that, yeah, I've made every, I checked in every day. All right, thank you, I'm done, thank you. Thank you. Jennifer. Hi, I, I had the same question as Judy about asking you to clarify what you mean by planning out when you go out. Um, and my concern was, you mentioned possibly taking Uber and not drinking and driving. One of the conditions of your probation was abstaining from alcohol. Are you still using alcohol during your probation? I am not using alcohol during my probation this past um, year and nine months. Um, what I meant by that is after my second DUI, well, how, what I did to change. Okay, thank you. Kathy. Thank you. That was also one of my questions. And I thank you very much for coming. And it sounds, I really appreciate the letters the veterinary employers have written for you. It sounds like they give you extra responsibility and you're really taking um, your profession seriously. I, I just had one question about, um, and I guess it's understood because we're, uh, we're uh, given that this, you have completed all these terms, but I didn't see the ethics training CE in here that was also a condition. It was eight hours every year of, of the probationary period. Are we, do we just assume that that's been uh, completed? It didn't have to be, it didn't be, have to be attached to her reduction pe petition? Well, if that's a question for me, yeah, the, the petition is, there's no requ requisite <coughs> documentation that she must, um, comp she must submit. Um, a lot of things are advisable. Um, but I, she didn't have to submit proof of ethics training. But again, I can, I can say that to the extent that I have not heard about any petitions to revoke her probation, which I would normally hear about if um, the board has any issues with her probation compliance, then I think the assumption can be that she has or is complying with her ethics ethics training response requirements. Thank you, I just wanted to clarify that. <coughs> Lee. But just before that, maybe we could have the direct testimony. Have yes. you complied with your ethics training requirements? I have submitted the courses and to see if they were acceptable for that, um, but I have not done them at this point. Because have they been approved yet, or are you waiting? Yes, they have been approved. Okay, so you are on, on track to satisfy the requirement. Yes. Okay, can, can we be clear on that? Yeah. yeah. When you say you have not taken the ethics courses, you've submitted the courses, board has approved them, but the conditions of probation require that you complete eight hours per year. Mm -hmm. So we're one year, nine months in now. You have not taken any of the eight-hour courses as of yet? No. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Osegueda. Thank you very much for coming here. We really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I wanted just to ask you to clarify some things you've made reference to that I think would help us to understand you. You talked about counseling, and I wondered if you could talk about when your counseling started and why you went into it and a little bit about what it was like, how often you had it, what kind of person you had it with, and a little bit more about what it's taught you and helped you with. The counseling <coughs> happened right after my second DUI. It was court ordered. Um, I did continue it for a year. Um, it was more of a group counseling. Um, and it's, it spoke different top, topics throughout the day. Um, the counselor at that time was very helpful because he would talk about th things that would benefit your health, um, even things that we wouldn't know is against the law, random things that would keep us more interested. And um, 
more knowledgeable and he would tell us stories how uh, with his experience in his life how he avoided and still at this point not drinking and that really motivated me in knowing that you can't control it and you can't control your life. Kathy, can I ask one follow-up question? I know, I know this is prospective, but um, is it your plan, the conditions of the parole of the probation were to abstain from alcohol through the period? Is your, is your plan to abstain from alcohol from now on? My plan is, I believe so, yes. That, that is my plan. Um, the reason why I'm here, or the reason why I want it reducted it's just for net financial. I don't mind the paperwork. I don't mind not drinking. That is not a problem for me. Um, it's not difficult for me at all. Um, and I truly respect the reason why I'm going through this and I understand the importance of it. Um, it's just financially, it's really difficult for me. Moving from California, from Nevada, it's become very expensive. And that's just the reason why. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. I have a follow I have a couple one of follow -ups. Well, just for me, one last question. With regards to the ethics course, you say that you're having problems financially on probation right now. Would that be one of the reasons you have not taken the ethics course? Is the ethics courses uh, financially prohibitive right now? Yes, that's the reason why I pushed it, and um, now it's overdue. Um, I believe the one I submitted cost approximately 160 to do. I'm sorry, Ms. Oklahoma. We we're on the same page, it's because <laughs> that, that's really where I was going to go, because I think the obvious question or issue is you're asking the board to take you off of probation. That's your request, to reduce the probation, right? And, but by this, at the same time, you haven't complied with all of the, the conditions of probation, specifically the ethics training. Like, theoretically, or not theoretically, you should have, since you've already been on probation for a year and nine months, that first year, you should have taken an ethics course. So, I guess one of the, I guess your reasoning is, and, 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 ex, and expand on this for the for the benefit of the board, was that you you didn't take it that first year because it was at least it sounds like what you just said was that it was financially burdensome for you. If there's more to that, it, this is the time for you to explain to the board because. You're asking for something that might be difficult to provide in light of the fact that one of the terms hasn't been complied with at all. So I think you should speak to that. Okay. Um, I believe the reason why I wasn't compliant was due to financial reasons. Um, I didn't communicate it or um, talked about it because I didn't understand it was to complete those hours within the year um, until now. Why well, didn't come in realization? Okay. So did you think that you had to comply by the end of the term of the probation? What was, what, yes. what is that? Was that your assumption? Yeah. So you thought you had three years to take the ethics course? Yes, exactly. Okay. And that's why you were procrastinating, it was costly, so you were putting it off? Yes. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, thanks. Okay, anything else? Do we have any other questions from the board? No, thank you. Ms. Sokoloff, closings? No. Any closing? No. On your part? No, no. Do you have any final? comments you want to make, Ms. Asiega. 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 My apologies. Do you have any final questions you want to make? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, statements you want to make to the board? 
Um, I just want to say um, thanks for having me here, everybody. Um, I, I do take this very serious. Nothing else. Why don't you take a minute and you can finish yeah. your thoughts. I just want to say I understand this process um, and why we are concerned when 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 someone gets a DUI. I understand the severity. Um, I just want to let everyone know I am very responsible now. I did learn my lesson, and I feel like. Um, that my team members, they do trust me. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, we'll take this matter under submission. Thank you very much for coming before the board. As I think it was articulated by several board members, it does take a lot of courage to come in and sit before this many people and really explain what's going on in your life at this time. So we do appreciate you coming in. Thank you. We'll take a break now, and then when we come back from break, we're going to close session. <coughs>